Hello, I'm David Lukoff, former president of the Association for Transpersonal Psychology in the United States. And I have been to oh, 15 or more Eurotas conferences and really enjoyed my time there. And unfortunately, due to my daughter's about to be, uh, become a mother here, I'm uh, having to stay here in Germany. <clears throat> but what I'd like to share with you today is how transpersonal psychology changed the world. And um, that has been a theme of Jim Fadiman's, um, who I hope you have had a chance to see at this meeting. So um, that's actually a quote of Jim's. We changed the world. We just did not get credit for it. So let me talk about the ways in which transpersonal psychology changed not only psychology, but the entire healthcare field. It helped legitimate psychology as an important area of strengths and conflicts that need to be addressed in all of healthcare. It pioneered the therapeutic use of alternative spiritual practices, such as meditation and yoga, and it highlighted the value of uh, altered states of consciousness in therapy, such as psychedelic drugs, visualization, and psychotic states. So <clears throat> spirituality has been linked with healthcare since the beginning, since the days of our uh, hunting and gathering ancestors. And this is a picture of a modern kind of equivalent, a Native American medicine man, we could also call a shaman. And here he is conducting a ritual, a religious ritual for somebody who has an illness. And um, even our Greek ancestors, when somebody was sick, they would go to the temple of Asclepius. He was a god. And they would spend the night there with temple priests and try to have a healing dream. So again, healthcare and religion were linked back in our Western ancestry. And the very, very first um, hospitals were both in churches, starting in the Middle Ages, and at about the same time, um, the uh, Buddhist communities in Asia opened up the very first hospitals in Asia. So again, a linking between religion and healthcare um, that we lost starting with the uh, Na with N Napoleon and since their science and spirituality have been kept very apart. And I wanna give credit to Stan and Christina Graf for starting that conversation on a really wide cultural level. Um, so, <clears throat> One of the things that they actually did was uh, trigger the work on spiritual emergency that led to this DSM problem that I was one of the co-authors of called Religious or Spiritual Problem, which acknowledged for the first time that religion and spirituality uh, would be subjects that therapists needed to talk about with their clients. And this was a breakthrough to have that be accepted within the mainstream of uh, mental health. And that was really all due to the work of Stan and Christina Groff on spiritual emergencies. That triggered this. And now uh, a few of us are working on broadening it from just focusing on spiritual problems to also focusing on spiritual strengths as another subject that needs that therapists need to address. And we have now published articles in American Psychological Association journals on this topic. This one was called Spiritual and Religious Competencies in Psychology. And we also published a book on religious and spiritual competencies. So this is start the start of that process of really moving religion and spirituality into the mainstream. Second, 
transpersonal psychology pioneered the therapeutic use of alternative spiritual practices such as meditation and yoga. And this is a picture of Ram Das with his guru um, in India. And he, at least on his work with his guru, uh, Star, the Maharishi Das, um, published an article, the first article on meditation that viewed meditation not as a religious practice, but as something that had mental and physical benefits. And that was a radical idea when he published this in a paper in the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology in 1970. And just to show how really, really radical this was, even Jung was opposed to looking at things like meditation and yoga as part of something that Westerners should uh, get involved with. He said, you cannot be a good Christian and practice genuine yoga at the same time. The trouble is that Western man cannot get rid of his history easily. That is written in his blood. I would not advise anyone to touch yoga. So this was so radical, even for the alternative parts of psychology, to say nothing of how radical it was for the mainstream. And part of it is that we now have accumulated lots of research on meditation, uh, mindfulness, yoga, and spirituality in general, showing that these are generally beneficial for our clients. And it enabled people like me to write articles. This was based on my doctoral dissertation where I used meditation. I used yoga with patients. And that was published in 1986. And then in 2017, I published another article on uh, using mindfulness uh, in therapy with patients. And I, I was not a, uh, I just want to give credit for, again, Stan and Christine McGraw for opening this door so that people like me could do, do this kind of work and use uh, mindfulness practices with patients. And then transpersonal psychology highlighted the value of altered states of consciousness, such as psychedelic drugs, visualization, and psychotic states. And well, I know <clears throat> there have been presentations on psychedelics at this conference, and there were at many conferences that I was at. It's, you could say, really, that its origins of talking about psychedelic-assisted therapy started with transpersonal psychology. And many of the pioneers of transpersonal psychotherapy that use psychedelics to enhance therapy were founders of the field of transpersonal psychology, like Stan Groff and Jim Fadiman. And again, it enabled people like me to write articles about this for the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. This one was written before it all became legalized and uh, uh, published this article in 1992. And um, this is a picture of Rick looking very uh, socially appropriate. Um, I met him initially at transpersonal psychology conferences uh, where he walked around in t-shirts and Birkenstock sandals. Now, of course, he has been the pioneer opening the doors to psychedelic studies um, around the world. And kudos to him for that work that he has been doing. And then transpersonal psychology also enabled uh, places like Japan to reintroduce their practices back into the mainstream there. Um, Zen has really been dying out in Japan. And this is a picture of a workshop that my wife Crystal and I gave in a Zen temple. It was talking about how uh, spirituality and mindfulness can be beneficial to patients who are facing uh, a life-threatening illness and who are dying. And this was not part of the Zen tradition to work with people who are dying. There were no Zen hospices in Japan. The first Zen hospice was in San Francisco. So this enabled the work on mindfulness done by many transpersonal psychologists enabled us to come back to Japan and reintroduce mindfulness in that way. And this is a picture of 
Stu Savatsky, who did the same in India. He enabled Indian psychologists to start using their practice of meditation in India, which at the time of this conference in 2008 was considered uh, a religious practice and not appropriate for psychologists. And we held a conference in India that started to bring attention to mindfulness back to India. <clears throat> and then I was actually sought out to teach a workshop in Kyrgyzstan that incorporated spirituality because they felt that they couldn't just adopt Western practices that were alien to all of their people. So they found that transpersonal psychology enabled them to bring Western psychology to Kyrgyzstan in a way that was sensitive to their spiritual beliefs. And David Edwards is a South African psychologist who argued the exact same thing that transpersonal psychology has a number of features that make it particularly relevant to the South African context. It recognizes the importance of a variety of states of consciousness. Transpersonal psychology is much less Eurocentric than many other approaches in psychology, which allows for genuine dialogue with African traditional healers. Um, and then I just want to point out that that's uh, also uh, something that transpersonal psychology enabled uh, people to then pay attention to was uh, practices not only of Western mythology, which included pawn, part of our word panic, um, or um, psyche, a Greek god who we named psychology after, but we can also now talk about other things, the Mahabharata and other Asian texts and so on. And that was also because of transpersonal psychologists' focus on bringing in indigenous practices and Asian practices and so on. So these are the ways that I can think we can safely say that transpersonal psychology has changed the world and we're the beneficiaries of this with much more freedom now to make use of the world's wisdom traditions and spiritual practices than we were before transpersonal psychology started its work. So thank you.